morning everyone. My name is Dr. Sandy Lugupega. I'm 21 years old and I'm currently practicing in Peter Maristek uh, Complex in Kosovo Natal. I'm here today to give you a lecture on medical ethics. During this lecture, I know they're taking pictures, but you're not supposed to take any pictures. No noise, no moving, no laughing. You have to switch off your cell phone. Everything needs to be off. Well, that's what my lecture used to say. I'm just here to give you a brief overview on the ethical dilemmas that we face in the medical practice, the challenges that we face every day, and uh, just share with you the experiences that I've had in the past 10 months after I also have started working in the past 10 months. Well, for many years, common practice in medicine meant that doctors made decisions for their patients. This had been a traditional view that, of paternalism, that by doing this, they're doing what's best for them. However, a contemporary view endorses the paradigm shift gets towards involving patients in every decision that is taken. This um, realization of the paradigm shift is anchored by the evolving medical ethics, um, the respect of patients' autonomy. So now, every decision that is taken, the doctors involve patients. There's no more paternalism, but it does happen in some cases. Well, uh, the man called uh, Keith L. in 1993, he once said that it's very wrong that a medical practitioner would force or make a judgment on a patient even, or do something or, or offer medical treatment when a patient refuses. So if the patient is fully conscious and is of sound mind and they can make their own decision, that patient has the right to refuse whatever the medical practitioner is giving it to them if they don't agree with it. Well, as I've said, I'm just here to share with you the challenges that are faced in providing ethical healthcare. Medical ethics is a very big topic and it can take days, months to discuss the topic because there are different ethical dilemmas that we face every day in the medical practice. So I just wanna give you, I'm talking about medical ethics. I just, Maybe I should define it to you. What are medical ethics? Medical ethics are moral principles that govern the practice of medical doctors and other healthcare workers. And there are four basic principles uh, that we follow in the medical practice. The first one, which is respect of patient's autonomy, to acknowledge the fact that the patient can make their own decisions and base it on their own personal beliefs and values. The second one, which is harm, which is non-maleficence. The third one, which is also important, which used to be... Um, the one that used to be practiced before, the act of paternalism, but now it's professional be beneficence of doing no harm and making sure that the patient is, uh, the sorry, it's do good and making sure that the patient receives best treatment. So you're acting on the patient's best interest. The, third, the fourth one, which is justice and no discrimination, that means no discrimination towards all patients that come to you, so you must give them fair treatment. So who decides? What is ethical? So we have the Hippocratic Oath that we say when we're in medical school in first year. We also say it when we're in final year as well. It's just a uh, privilege and honor to, to say the Hippocratic Oath because that's what you, when, when you've qualified in final year and you're told that now it's the time to say for the oath is one of the most memorable experiences that you have as a medical doctor because that's what guides you in the medical <coughs> practice. The second one is the medical associations that are in the world. They make guidelines for us on how, what is ethical. The third, the third one in South Africa, we have the HPCSA. So in each and every country has its own um, association that helps us uh, with the ethics or the ethical dilemmas that we face. So what is involved in making an et uh, ethical decision? So it's either rational or non-rational. And the ethical decision does not only involve the guidelines that are offered by the, by the HPCSA or the World Organization. The guideline can be used as a recommendation and they do not explain every situation that is encountered. So you can use the guidelines to this with you can use the guidelines based on the situation that you are given, but not all the situations that you will find in the medical practice will be the ones that are in the guidelines. So the steps that you use uh, when making an ethical decision is to ask for yourself if there is an ethical problem in the problem that you're faced with, and it's important to consult with authoritative sources, the World uh, Medical Association, the HPCSA, so go and find guidelines on how to approach the situation. And also consider alternative solutions which will be on the patient's best interest. And discuss the 
proposed solution to those who are affected. So it's important to discuss with your patient and make the decision as guided by the medical ethics, as I've mentioned. Here, with this very difficult question, which is a central dilemma in medical ethics, what is more important, patients' rights or saving lives? I've talked about patient autonomy, which is uh, respecting their ability to make their own decisions, and then there's also beneficence. Sometimes a patient can refuse treatment. So what do you do in that case? So it's respect for autonomy, have priority over professional beneficence, that's the question. So I'm just going to share with you four cases that might, uh, uh, that might give you an understanding on how you act in different situations in the medical practice. So this is the first case. Um, it's basically going to read it for you, but I actually realized, because I just took it from the book as it is, I realized there are some very difficult um, terminology. So I'm just going to say, in 2003, there was a baby, um, there was a neonate, a neonate is a newborn, uh, had, was referred to the Garden City Clinic in Johannesburg and developed neonatal sepsis. So it's an overwhelming infection in neonates, in newborns, so which is very bad. So the, the patient had the bone marrow, the patient had bone marrow suppression due to the sepsis. And uh, oh, so as a result of the bone marrow suppression, the patient had anemia. So if you have anemia, you need transfusion. So the pediatrician decided to discuss the, the transfusion with the parents. But the parents said, no, because the, they refused the transfusion based on the grandparents' uh, religious views because they were Jehovah's Witness. So they refused the treatment. And the anemia, the anemia can precipitate a lot of uh, conditions and, and it can also precipitate cardiac failure. So if you have cardiac failure, you most likely won't make it if you don't receive a transfusion or there's no intervention that is taken. So the doctor then made an application to the High Court for the uh, permission to administer the life-saving treatment. So the ethical question in this case is that should the doctor override the decision of the parents and just give the transfusion? Should um, Was it correct for the doctor to go to the high court for permission to administer the life-saving transfusion? And is it right for the parents to make the decision for the child even though the best treatment is not what they're opting for? So when you're looking, that's one of the ethical questions that you have. So when you're answering these ethical questions, you have to be guided by the medical ethics. So looking at this case, the child is too young, cannot make their own decisions, and uh, they basically, no one knows what they will be when they make their own decisions. They, no one knows if they will be Jehovah's Witness or not. So as a physician, you have to act on the patient's best interest, provided that you have explained to the relatives or the parents that the best treatment for this patient is transfusion. And uh, the, because the parents were also um, worried about the risk of transmission of infection or other diseases, you also have to consider that. And you have to risk the benefits to the risk ratio. So the benefits of transfusion are way more better than the minor risk that it poses to the child, the transfusion. They can, might get hepatitis or HIV, but it uh, goes to SANPS. They properly make sure that the, there's no infection. So in this case, the doctor has to act in the patient's best interest and give the transfusion to the child. Second case, uh, Mrs. R was admitted with upper uh, GI bleeding, so upper gastrointestinal bleeding from it, uh, an ulcer. So on examination, she was fully alert, well orientated, with mild respiratory distress. She was pale, uh, low BPs, increased pulse rate, and bipedal edema. So she was starting to develop heart failure as well, and her formal hemoglobin, which is uh, normally it's above 12, was low, which is 3.5. So the patient was severely anemic. Uh, the best chance of saving her life is an agent transfusion along with surgery to arrest the bleeding. So Dr. K explained to the patient the importance and benefits of the transfusion. However, the patient refused blood transfusion and accepted any intervention with non-blood products. So in this case, the patient is fully alert. They can make their own decisions. As a doctor, you have to act on the patient's best interest. You, uh, and their best interest is their right to not give them the transfusion. So you have to give them the next uh, available non-blood uh, product and also take them to theater. But you have to make sure that you have explained to them the importance of uh, giving the transfusion and that it's very risky to take someone to theater with such a low HB 
and they might have a risk for bleeding as well. So it's very risky. Having made sure that you've done that, then you've fulfilled your obligation as a medical doctor. And unfortunately, it's one of patients that I've witnessed as during this past 10 months, and the patient didn't make it. And you question yourself, should I just, are you doing enough for these patients? But you know, you, you have all those questions in your mind that you're not doing enough, but you've fulfilled your obligation. The patient understands why um, the treatment is important, but they still refuse. The next case is about physician or patient confidentiality. Confidentiality is very important in the medical practice, and you have to make sure that you, you've maintained the confidentiality with your patient. So this case happened in Glasgow, I guess it's in Scotland. Um, this patient was a 33-year-old uh, intravenous drug user who became HIV infected uh, while in prison. So he received harm reduction counseling from a nurse while in prison and uh, was subsequently released and had a sexual relationship with, partner, with his partner, but did not disclose his status. Furthermore, he told uh, her that using condom was not necessary. So Anne was subsequently tested positive as well. The partner tested positive. So the case was taken to the court and the, and the guy was found guilty for, for causing harm to the, patient, to the person. So in South Africa, we haven't had um, many cases with, um, in, in this sort. And normally we don't have, uh, in our guidelines, we don't have clear guidelines on how to act on the situation uh, when someone has done this to, to the next patient. So it, we always talk about confidentiality, which is very important. But as a medical practitioner, it is your duty to make sure that you advise the patient, make sure that they fully understand why it's important to disclose, and give them a certain time frame that they have to disclose. And if they unreasonably do not disclose to the patient, uh, to the other person, then uh, disclosure has to happen without the patient's consent. But the last case, it's uh, forced rectal exam uh, steers ethical questions. This case happened in uh, New York. A 33-year-old male had an head injury at work, then was admitted and hospitalized in the emergency unit, and the doctor told the patient that you need a PR exam, a rectal exam, and to determine whether there was a spinal cord injury. However, this guy refuses the PR exam, and doctor explained the importance of the exam with patients that are presenting with head injuries, but still the patient refuses and under any circumstances. So doctor ordered restraints, and Mr. P was forcefully examined, uh, Five years later, the guy comes back, still traumatized, uh, claims that he cannot work and has post-traumatic stress disorder. So he decided to take the doctor to court for the changes. So here you look at the issue of informed consent, the patient's right. The patient had a right to say no, and the doctor has no right to also uh, force the patient with the examination if they refuse, even though they're at risk. Sometimes the doctor's arguing that patients that have head injuries, they're not able to make decisions. But this patient fully was aware of everything that is happening. So in this case, the issue of informed consent is very important. So I don't have time. Um, clearly, it's very, there are no hard and fast rules to this issue, simply because different patients have different illnesses, demanding different levels of attention and sensitivity. So as a medical professional, it's very important to make sure that you treat patients differently and you look at each and, even, in each and every situation on it and decide on each case uh, based on what the circumstances are on that case. So sometimes the patient's right, usually, most of the time patient's right usually override uh, uh, the beneficence at some times when the patient is fully conscious and they're making the decision for themselves. But in some cases, like in a child, you have to override the patient's right because the child cannot make their own decision. The child, parents are making the decision. And if the decision for the parent is unreasonable and it's causing harm to the child, and as a doctor, it's your duty to make sure that you provide the best treatment for the child, so you act in the child's best interest. Thank you.